Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We are now about 10 days short of the second anniversary of the Memorial Day 2019 tornado outbreak. There is so much about this weather event that we'd like to discuss here tonight. My name is Andy Hatzos. I'm a meteorologist at the National Weather Service office in Wilmington, Ohio. I was one of the people heavily involved in the outbreak, both in terms of issuing tornado warnings during the event and doing storm surveys and other follow-up work after the event. I'm joined tonight by two other meteorologists from our office, Kristen Cassidy and Nate McGinnis. You'll be hearing from them tonight as well. So with that, we're gonna get started. Many of you have probably seen this map before. Um, it's a map of all of the tornadoes that occurred in Ohio from this outbreak. And in terms of the numbers, for our forecast office in Wilmington, we cover 52 counties in Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky, and 19 tornadoes, the largest outbreak we've ever had in our office's history. It was also the third largest outbreak that ever occurred in the state of Ohio, with two others that, uh, that were still just a little bit ahead of it. The tornado outbreak that was historic in number, historic in magnitude, and because it occurred well after nightfall, there was also a tornado outbreak that was largely unseen with the only actual images from the tornadoes coming from scenes lit by lightning from traffic cameras like this one or a few grainy videos that people took. Now this is a question that was asked on the registration form as something that we want to ask again to start this whole thing off. Were you personally affected? Because I know a lot of people attending tonight probably were affected by it. So we're going to start this poll and uh, allow people to put in their answers. If you were personally affected by this or maybe indirectly affected, a tornado outbreak like this has impacts that range so far and wide, yeah, even people that weren't directly impacted. And that's something that, that I'm going to start with, start this presentation off with, is, uh, is how people have, have been impacted by that to some degree. So the results of the poll, we have over, over half of the people who responded were either directly or indirectly impacted by this event. And so for, for people who were, and that certainly includes us at the Weather Service, uh, it, it's, it's kind of personal, especially when you have an event of this magnitude, the strong tornadoes that we had, the number of tornadoes that we have, the impacts that are still being felt around the area, even now, just about two years later. There are many stories to tell um, from people who were impacted this event, including people who I know are, are participating in this tonight. Um, but I want to share a few from people that I've that I've talked to from from Bob in Trotwood. He says around 1050 p.m. the debris ball and circulation were clearly heading east, about three miles west of our house. We heard the winds increasing at this point, sounds of sporadic hail hitting the house and roof. There was vivid and continuous lightning. We heard thumping on the back decks. I felt the pressure difference in my ears. The bathroom door was shaking as if someone wanted to get inside throughout all this. We heard the continuous background noise of the winds as if a farmer had his heavy and loud tractor plowing the fields to our south. My friends Jake, Aaron Cameron, in the Inglewood and Vandalia area, a holiday night with friends. Our plan to watch the next to last episode of the miniseries Chernobyl together. The chance of dangerous weather, the wisest idea was to gather where there was some form of sanctuary. Our friend's basement was the best option. Near the episode's end credits, our TV switched to an emergency broadcast and every single phone in the house began to go off. Later that night, I made my way home to Miller Lane and there was no clear way home. The local church steeple had been damaged. The local wing joint was half gone. Many wires had been ripped from the posts or knocked down. We're still actively producing a visible untamed circuit, a mixture of adrenaline and what can easily be described as fear. From Casey in Dayton, at 10 p.m. I went to Stanley and I-75 to work. At 10.23, the plant take shelter alarms were activated. I kept people sheltered until midnight. We had no power. It was only after sunrise we could see it all. No major damage to the plant, no one injured or killed. Two years later, people are still rebuilding. They have risen to the challenge, but you can see damage recalling that night. Too many people have had to start at square one again. From Shauna, who worked with the Red Cross. I received a call at 2.30 a.m. asking if I could serve as the manager to open the Trotwood High School shelter. School bus headlights lit the parking lot 
an entrance to the cafeteria where I found residents displaced by tornado damage. It was clear that I needed to secure an alternate location for the population given the need for multiple days to weeks, they would need sheltering. And she went on to say that she had been involved in other roles in the efforts of recovery all the way through August of 2019. From our colleagues at Dayton Skywarn, the amateur radio network, Don, Dave, Gary, and others, providing us with some of the early reports of the tornadoes and the damage in the Dayton area. People with the Ohio Department of Transportation who famously used trucks equipped with snow plows to clear debris off of I-75 to try and get the road open, debris that had been deposited by the EF4 tornado just north of downtown Dayton. Just think about all the different aspects that come with this kind of disaster, all the different ways people are impacted, the different ways people have to respond. Hearing some of these stories, there are so many things that I've never even considered. So many ways people were affected, so many ways people could find ways to contribute. We wanna hear more of these stories. So one more thing that we're going to do is provide a way for people who wanna share their stories with us to do so. We don't always get to hear directly, maybe from some people, but not from a lot who are impacted from a weather event like this. And so this is a chance for us to do so. What we plan to do is take some of those stories and record them in addition to this presentation and then add that to the end of the recording before we post it online. And then also share the stories with the rest of our staff at the office. So hopefully you'll be able to uh, share that with us when we get that sent out in a little bit. So with that, let's get into what happened behind the development of the storms on Memorial Day 2019. Well, we're gonna start with uh, what went on in the atmosphere that day. And I'm gonna borrow some things from our annual weather spotter training class. What are the ingredients that you need to get a thunderstorm to form? Well, one of those ingredients is you need a source of lift to act as something that can kickstart the thunderstorm development. One very common source of lift that we always talk about is cold fronts. We did not have a cold front in this situation. So we were looking for a different type of a source of lift to get these thunderstorms to form. Another thing that we need is instability, which is when you have warmth and moisture in the air, because that warmth and moisture helps the air to rise, to form clouds, to form thunderstorms, cumulus into cumulonimbus, and so on and so on. And the most common way that we get a source of heat at the ground is the sun. The Memorial Day outbreak occurred at night. We didn't have the sun. So there was another source of instability that must have occurred. Another thing you need in order to get severe thunderstorms of the worst type is wind shear. Wind shear helps to keep thunderstorm updrafts and downdrafts separate, which makes them live longer. Wind shear causes the updrafts of thunderstorms to rotate, and that can lead to the updrafts becoming stronger and the storms becoming more capable of severe weather. We look at wind shear in terms of the speed, how much the speed of the wind changes as you go up through the atmosphere, and in the direction, how the, the wind's changing direction as you go up through the atmosphere as well. And what happens is when you have enough wind shear, you can get supercell thunderstorms to form. Supercell thunderstorms are the strongest type of thunderstorm that we have to deal with. They live longer. They're more capable of producing severe weather, any type of severe weather, including large hail, damaging winds, and certainly tornadoes. And the types of thunderstorms that we had during this event were supercells. That was what was responsible for the tornadoes that occurred during this outbreak. So how all did this weather setup come together for that? We're gonna have to just take a step back to the very quiet morning hours. When I walked into the office at 7 a.m. for a morning shift on the morning of Memorial Day, over Iowa, there was an area of low pressure with a warm front that was extending across Northern Illinois, Northern Indiana, and into the state of Ohio. And that setup basically continued into the afternoon here. The expectation was that we had some warm and moist air, just like you get in, in the spring and summer a lot of times, that was moving into the area behind this warm front. And over the course of the day, the expectation was that we were going to see an area of showers and thunderstorms begin to develop and strengthen over Illinois and Indiana, and then eventually drift into our forecast area here in Ohio, Southeast Indiana, and Northern Kentucky as well. So the expectation for severe weather was that the most significant conditions were actually going to be in that area near where the storms were expected to develop in Northern Illinois, Northern Indiana, with the greatest tornado potential also sort of being in that area. And the expectation that we had was that as these storms got going and moved into our area, the main threat would be damaging winds. Now, damaging winds are the most common type of severe weather that we deal with. 
Um, we certainly thought there was a chance of large hail and tornadoes as well, and this is very early in the morning. But um, what we had was a situation where we were expecting these storms are going to congeal into a line or some sort of cluster that was going to have a wind damage threat as the primary issue. So we began to look into things a little more closely and see if that was actually still going to be the case. What I'm showing you here is basically an ensemble of models, a cluster of different computer models with different solutions that can give us an idea of how much confidence we have in that forecast scenario. Now I'm going to zoom in on a couple of these and sort of step through in time the forecasts that some of these computer models were showing to us. And you can see a couple of things. First off, they, they look different. The one on the bottom looks like you have a bunch of storms that congeal into a line or a big cluster, which would probably present a, a threat for wind damage. Some of the other ones, though, the, uh, suggest that maybe you're going to have storms that stay a little bit more discreet, meaning storms that stay separate from the others, meaning they might be supercell thunderstorms, which tend to do that. But you also notice we didn't even know for sure what the timing was going to be. I mean, you're looking at multiple hour differences. Are they coming into the area at 9 p.m., 10 p.m., or is it going to be even later than that? So there was still a lot of uncertainty that morning in terms of not just uh, the threat, but just you know the timing and how the storms would even kind of look on radar. So that made forecasting it a little bit difficult right at the beginning. But we started to look a little more closely into what we call the mesoscale environment. Basically, what are the, the strength of things like instability and wind shear? what kind of environment are these storms going to be developing in? And so here's a, a computer model atmospheric sounding. And what we're looking at here is we're trying to assess what are the winds going to look like in terms of a vertical profile, similar to if you were launching a weather balloon to measure the temperature and the moisture and the winds above the ground. We'll do it, we're basically doing the same here with a computer forecast. And we notice a couple of things, that there is a lot of instability Basically, the big red area on there is all the instability, um, but we're also right at the edge of it. Sometimes the strongest storms develop in areas where maybe you're not in the area where there's the most instability, but it's sort of that gradient, that edge where the instability is is moving in, is a, kind of on the edge of it where you have less to the north, more to the south usually is how it works out. And in that area sometimes is where you can get the, the more storms to actually develop. But we also looked at the winds because wind shear in terms of both direction and speed is a very important component in forecasting tornadoes. And we saw a significant amount of, of wind shear, uh, enough that it was very, very concerning and a significant amount of wind shear very close to the ground in the lowest, say, kilometer or so above the Earth's surface. These are things that are very problematic because both of these factors are indications to us that tornadoes are going to be a bigger threat perhaps than we were initially thinking if the storms can develop into individual discrete supercells. And if that happens, then we're gonna need at least six people in here tonight. And so we started to begin to take steps to staff up and get ready for a bigger event. Some of the later computer models that came out I'm going to show you some of these from a little bit later that afternoon. All of a sudden, all that uncertainty we had earlier, pretty much everything we're looking at now is suggesting that we're going to have individual discrete supercell thunderstorms. And we knew that in that type of environment, with that type of instability and that type of wind shear, that storms like this were going to be a significant problem. And so not just the tornadoes could be a possibility, but strong tornadoes could be a possibility. So we took three actions that afternoon to sort of start to move the forecast and our process into uh, in the right direction that we wanted to move it to. Uh, the Storm Prediction Center's probabilities for tornadoes, forecasts that they issue frequently and update frequently, we worked with them to expand that a little bit more into the Miami Valley area, part of our forecast area. Another thing we did was created our own contingency schedule, basically created a plan to have more people in the office because we knew we were going to be a situation where we might have strong tornadoes. We're going to have lots of people needing to help issue warnings and answer phone calls and keep the forecast updated and so on. And the third thing that we did was we made an update on social media and we're very specific to use the T word, the tornado word here. There are there are times where we uh, maybe are a little bit, you know, you don't want to scare people in situations where where the severe weather threat's not that bad. 
but we were seeing things that were very concerning. So we were pretty clear with this update in the afternoon that there is a tornado threat. And not just that, but the highest time risk for severe storms is 7 p.m. until midnight, late in the evening, after dark. And it's very important to get the word out that storms are going to be significant moving that late into the night. And so that's one of the steps that we that we wanted to take. So as we get a little closer to the event, I want to show you how that that kind of uh, the mesoscale environment, how the how the storms ended up playing out. Um, that warm front had actually moved north through the majority of our area. That put most of the forecast area in the warm sector. So you had temperatures that were in the 70s. You had dew points, the amount of moisture in the middle to even upper 60s. So it was fairly warm, especially for this time of night, and it was fairly moist as well. The things that you need for instability were still there that late at night. And the winds were out of the southeast, which is important because it provided that little extra bit of directional shear, of turning of the winds as you go up in height, that can help make tornadoes form and help make tornadoes stronger. Now you notice over the far southwestern, like the Cincinnati area, Air was even warmer down there, but this is an area where we never even got thunderstorms to develop. But what was going on is you had convergence, which is another one of those sources of lift where you have winds kind of blowing together into each other because you've got winds at different directions out of the south in the Cincinnati area, out of the southeast everywhere else. And that convergence is something that can help air to move up and a source of lift to get thunderstorms to develop. Here's what the winds looked like at the surface, basically at the ground level, out of the southeast over south, southwestern Ohio, western Ohio, and so on. But as you go up a little bit higher, you can see the winds change to the south and get stronger. As you go up a little higher from there, the winds change to the southwest and get a little bit stronger. And as the winds go up even higher, the winds are out of the west. Now, the storms that we had that night basically moved sort of west to east, um, even with a little bit of a southward component, maybe kind of northwest to southeast in, in, in some cases. And the direction of the winds in the atmosphere is something that helps determine that, um, in addition to other things involving the rotating updrafts of the thunderstorms and the amount of instability and where that instability is coming from and so on. Um, but the storm motions you think of for storms a lot of times move from southwest to northeast, and in this case, they were moving a little bit differently. So where was that moisture and warmth coming from? Basically, just look at the orange colors on this map. That's kind of our pool of moisture, of uh, heat, that is going to increase over the area as we get to 8 p.m., as we get to 9 p.m., as we get to 10 p.m. Basically, didn't matter that the sun had gone down because we've got these strong winds uh, a little bit off the surface coming out of the southwest that are bringing more warmth and bringing more moisture into the area, which is going to keep instability up, even as you get past sunset, even as you get towards midnight, and keep these thunderstorms, these very significant supercell thunderstorms, keep them going very late into the night. I'll show you the instability that we were looking at. And again, sometimes right on that northern edge of where the highest instability is, it wasn't over Warren County and Clinton County that these tornadoes occurred. It was another couple counties north of there on the northern gradient of that instability. One other thing that we did was we, um, we took the radar from our office in Wilmington, and we're actually able to sort of use that to determine the wind, speed, and direction as you go up through the atmosphere, which helps us to determine how much wind shear is available. Uh, one thing we look at for that is what's called storm relative helicity. It's basically, basically uh, a way of, of measuring the amount of, of speed and directional wind shear very close to the ground. And we're only looking a kilometer up, and we have values that are over 500. Now, maybe these values are, you know, are something that isn't meaningful to the non-meteorologist here, but for the meteorologist here, they're looking at that number with their eyes wide open because values like this just don't happen that much. We can even increase that to over 700 if we go through the lowest three kilometers of the atmosphere, basically telling us that we've got a situation where there is an extreme amount of wind shear available for these storms that are developing. And we know in those cases, all the research has told us, in those cases, you don't just have a potential for tornadoes, but you're sort of getting into 
the, the regime where strong tornadoes, uh, higher higher end tornadoes, are very possible, even perhaps violent tornadoes. About 8:20 p.m. that night, a tornado watch was issued. As the storms were over Indiana, the expectation they would continue moving into our area. And with that, I'll set it up how things were looking at our office. This is our office operations floor. If you, you've never seen it, this is what it looks like. A whole lot of computer screens and a very nice picture up, up on the wall behind us. We had eight people in that night. I was sitting on this desk right here as the primary radar operator. Now, in terms of roles for this kind of weather event, we, we don't have a specific plan for every single weather event, but we have a framework of expectations that we can build around so that all the specific operational tasks that we need in our office are, are defined and you can bring in additional people and, and put them in additional roles to, to help out as well. So for me, I was, I was done with my regular shift duties, the forecast and whatever else, I'd actually gone home and then come back in. So because of that, those are typically the people who get assigned to do radar and issue warnings, things like that. And so that was my primary job. But I also had help from Brian, who was our secondary radar operator for the event, also issuing warnings. We had Scott, who was helping out with hydrology concerns. We had some heavy rain, as well as aviation forecasts for the area airports. Alan was working on the main forecast that we still have to continue to put out, as well as internal coordination and some additional help on radar. Kristen, who you'll hear from later, she was also helping with both extra radar help and working on communications, uh, both internally and with the outside world. Chris was helping with communications as well as data acquisition, um, receiving observations and things like that. We had John helping out with additional internal coordination and radar help. We had a lot of people helping out on radar that night with the number of storms that we had. Jeff came in later and also helped out with the main forecast and aviation to kind of free the rest of us up to continue working on other things. So it's lots of people and there's a lot to keep us busy. You could very easily say, well, was it chaos? The answer is no, it wasn't. It was controlled because it was organized and because we know the roles that we have to fill we know that if those roles change, we can communicate those changes with each other and basically keep everything running like a well-oiled machine. So what ended up happening with those storms we were expecting to develop over Illinois and into Indiana? Well, it was actually not until Indiana and into Ohio where they really blew up and got going. And they reached their strongest point, of course, as they were moving into Indi uh, Ohio and moving across the Miami Valley area. You notice that's not where the initial risk area was. So it actually did occur a little bit later. And what I'll show you now is a radar loop of this event. Now I'll note that there were some storms coming out of Northern Indiana that had produced tornadoes earlier in the night, including a couple that were on the stronger end of the scale. But for the most part, you'll see these storms, especially the ones near Dayton and moving away from Dayton, these storms never really sort of congealed into a big cluster like we thought might happen originally. Instead, it was sort of the updated forecast where we ended up with storms that remain mostly separate, mostly discrete. And so I'm gonna show you that we had five tornadic supercells that produced the 19 tornadoes that were in our forecast area. The first one produced four tornadoes across Mercer, Auglaize counties, this storm also was uh, the one that produced several of the tornadoes in northern Indiana a little earlier in the night. There was another supercell that produced one tornado in Hardin County, Ohio. This supercell produced five tornadoes, including the EF3 that hit West Milton in Miami County. You have the worst supercell of them, the one that produced the EF4 that moved through Dayton. And then behind those, one more supercell that produced another three tornadoes, including the EF2 that hit the Inglewood and Vandalia areas, uh, in addition to a couple other tornadoes as well. So this is what we're looking at on radar. And we're gonna show you a lot of things on radar tonight. But what I wanna show you now is a little bit of what you're gonna be looking at on radar. The, this image is also from our spotter training class, and it's sort of a schematic of what a supercell thunderstorm looks like on radar. And one thing we can do is basically identify the features of a supercell using 
the supercell that was uh, producing the EF4 tornado in Montgomery County, you could see the edge of the anvil, which is sort of the, the clouds way, way, way up high in, in the atmosphere that are associated with, with the supercell storm. You can also see the main core of the storm, which was producing not just heavy rain, um, but also quite a bit of hail. And that is very typical in a strong to severe supercell thunderstorm. You can see the hook echo. This is where you have winds that are rotating around the rotating updraft of this supercell. And a lot of times in the hook echo, you might have what's uh, what's called the rear flank downdraft, which is where you can get an area of strong winds that develops, uh, strong straight line winds that develops. But that hook echo is also usually where it interfaces with the updraft of the thunderstorm, where you can get a tornado to develop. And what we're looking at here on radar is a debris ball. Now the radar can see things in the atmosphere like clouds and raindrops and snowflakes and hailstones and things. But if a tornado is lifting debris up into the air, well, our radar is gonna be able to see that as well. What we're looking at here is called reflectivity. It's a measure of the intensity of the things that our radar is seeing. Basically the echoes, when we send our radar signal out and it comes back to us, the strength of those echoes, how much stuff is our radar hitting? And so we can use that to see the shape of thunderstorms. We can use that to see where the hail and the rain is located. And in the case of a debris ball, we can also use that to see where debris is being lofted uh, into the air from a tornado. But we can also use what's called Doppler radar to examine the motions within a storm. We have the ability to see if winds are moving towards the radar. We have the ability to see if winds are moving away from the radar. Anything moving towards us at the radar site is gonna appear in green or blue, and anything moving away from us is going to appear in red or even orange. And when you have winds moving towards us and winds moving away from us right next to each other, we call that a couplet, and that is an indication of very strong rotation. And so we certainly saw that with the Dayton tornado. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at velocity, the speed and the direction of those radar echoes as they are moving both either toward the radar or away from the radar. It can help us find where there's strong winds and it can help us find where there are circulations within a thunderstorm. But we've got another thing. Several years ago, we got what's called a dual polarization radar upgrade, where instead of just sending out radar pulses on a horizontal plane, we also send out radar pulses on a vertical plane. So we can actually sort of measure the shape of the objects in terms of how different they are if we're looking at them just with a vertical or just with a horizontal radar pulse or with both a, a horizontal and a vertical radar pulse. And so we can use that information to infer things about the shape of objects in storms. We know that raindrops are shaped a certain way. We know that hailstones are shaped a certain way. But we know that if debris is lofted high into the atmosphere, that it's going to be shaped in a very chaotic way because we're talking about pieces of trees, pieces of grass, leaves, pieces of structures that have been lifted. And if we see an area on our correlation coefficient product, which tells us how uniform the sampled targets are, how, how similar or how different are the shapes of the things that we're looking at. And if we see an area that shows up in blue on this, it tells us that the objects are very non-uniform. And it tells us that we're probably sampling things that are not weather, they're not meteorological. And we can use that to tell how high debris is getting into a thunderstorm because it's been lifted there by a tornado. So those are some things that we're gonna look at. Our first warnings came out around nine o'clock that night. We were watching these thunderstorms move in from Indiana. This one moving into Wayne County, Indiana, where our first warning came out at 8.59 p.m. for this thunderstorm. Now, our warning strategies are gonna be different from one event to the next. Uh, there's sort of three keys to warning decisions. Um, one of those keys is what is the mesoscale environment like? What is the atmosphere like? And what kind of storms is it capable of producing? Um, and in this case, with the amount of wind shear and instability that we had, we knew that that was pretty much off the charts and that these storms would easily be capable of producing significant severe weather. So with that said, we're going to be pretty generous with these warnings tonight because we know that with what we're seeing on the radar, what we end up seeing on radar, that we could have very significant tornadoes develop. And we also know that because it's past nine o'clock at night, it's past dark, the other key to the warning decision process, of course, is if we have reports from people on the ground, from our spotters. 
And because it's at night, it's just the way it works. We're not going to get a lot of reports as many as we would during the day because it's dark and things are very difficult to see and even dangerous to go try and see. So our morning decisions are going to be kind of based around what we're seeing on radar, what we're seeing from the mesoscale environment. And we're going to be a little bit generous with some of those warnings. And in this environment, that is absolutely the right decision to make. So we continue this warning for this initial supercell as it's moving across Wayne County, Indiana, and eventually continue it into the state of Ohio. And then additional storms move in to the Mercer County area. And at this point, I'm very focused on these storms moving through Wayne County into Preble County, Dart County in Ohio. And so this is where we start the sectorization process where I say, I can't take these storms to the north. Uh, Brian, can you take those for me? And so Brian issues the tornado warning for Mercer County for the area, including Salina. And so here's what we're looking at on radar. If you're looking for a classic supercell structure here, you're probably not going to find it because these storms, they were still discrete. This was still a discrete supercell, but it was also still also kind of embedded within a larger area of sort of light to moderate rain. Nonetheless, it was still very significant. So we can look at the velocity on radar and watch as this storm tracks into the Salina area. And we see the greens on the, on the left and the reds on the right, indicating that we have a strong circulation here moving into the Salina area. And one other thing we'll see then, as it moves through Salina, is we also see signs that debris has been lofted. Now, when you have a circulation that is co-located with what we call a, uh, what, with, what, with what we are looking at on the correlation coefficient where we can see debris in the storm, we call this a tornadic debris signature. It's actually evidence from radar that we have a tornado that is on not just on the ground, but that has lifted debris to a, to a height that we can see it on the radar. Now, a height that we can see it on the radar in Salina, which is pretty far from our radar, is five or 6,000 feet, over, over a mile into the atmosphere. So as this was occurring, an EF3 tornado was moving through Salina and it continued on a little bit longer. And not only that, it produced an additional uh, three tornadoes in Auglaize County and a, and a nearby cell produced another tornado in Hardin County just a little bit thereafter. And that was the first tornadic debris signature that we experienced from this event, but it would not be the last. So at this point, it's clear that we've got a second supercell developing in Wayne County and it's going to be moving uh, west, kind of following behind this other one that we've got the warning out on here. And so make some decisions about how we're gonna handle the warning strategy here. So basically, normally tornado warnings that we issue are gonna be good for about a half hour. But because the way these storms had been persisting and living for a long time, we decided to change that default and basically with 45 minutes, go a little bit longer. And also, since these two cells were getting a little bit further apart from each other, what we wanted to do was separate the two warnings out and have one warning out for each cell so that we could be a little bit more specific about the threats and about the locations and, and try and time them out across the area and give people better warning information. So we're gonna focus on this one, moving out of Dark County and into Miami County. We're looking here in the area of West Milton, Laura. This is all part of Southwestern Miami County, Ohio. You can sort of see that there's got this, this supercell shape with the hook echo and the main precipitation core, but it's also sort of embedded in an area of rain. And it's also very close to the other supercell that's developed just to the Southwest of it. But if we flip over to velocity, the circulation is very obvious and it's tracking pretty much due east towards Laura, towards West Milton. And that circulation strengthens as it does so. And a tornado touched down just before it crossed the county line. And at this point, we also see that debris is beginning to be lofted into the air from this tornado as well. And when you get to your second debris signature of the event, and you're still got a lot of real estate of your forecast area yet to cover, you know the kind of night you're in for and that it's very bad news. So the tornado warning continued across Southern Miami County. I'm gonna show you another radar image here. Here's from our radar where we're looking at 
uh, rotational velocities that are very strong. But we also have a radar located near Cast Town in, in Miami County that's actually a terminal Doppler weather radar that serves the Dayton Airport. And it gives us a very high resolution view of what this tornado looks like. And the strength of the circulation, zoom in on it there, the strength of the circulation here was enough was enough that it, it, it made us start to consider if if we needed to increase the basically the urgency in the warnings that we were issuing that night. And that was something that was going to come up again later, as, as you'll see soon. You have a very strong circulation producing EF3 damage between Laura and West Milton at the time of this radar image from the Dayton Terminal Doppler radar. Now that circulation continued east, passing north of West Milton, and then eventually weakening, but with debris continuing on. It produced another EF0 tornado on the south side of Troy, and then another one as it got over towards the, uh, the, the, the end, end border of the county. But it was also produced some strong straight line winds that occurred to the south going into the Tip City area. And in fact, this was one of the only locations where we had much significant straight line winds from, from this event. The vast majority of the damage was done by tornadoes. So with that, that cell, as it moved through Miami County and then ended up moving into Clark County and Champaign counties, it did weaken. And so our attention shifted to this cell that's now moving out of Preble County into Montgomery County. And a warning at 1031 was issued for Preble County and Montgomery County. This was the first warning that was issued for the cell that would end up producing the Dayton Trotwood tornado. And to zoom in on this, I've got Trot, Trotwood and Brookville listed on the map, the first locations that were affected by this tornado. Now, the initial warning was issued while it was in Preble County, and the circulation was still starting to come together. But that circulation began to strengthen as it moved into Montgomery County. The tornado first touched down right around here, just a couple miles inside the county. We see our first evidence of debris from this tornado at about 10.44 p.m. This is basically at the time that the damage of about the EF2 level was being done in the community of Brookville. And as it moved onward, you can see a couple things change. If you look at the left side, you see the circulation go from strong to violent. This is as in, about as intense of a circulation, as intense of, of what you'll see for a radar couplet for velocity for a tornado as you'll ever find. You can also see on the right, you have a hook echo on, on reflectivity, but that very quickly turns into evidence of a debris ball, as we are now seeing the debris that is being lifted by the tornado as it has moved through the Brookville area. So at this point, we, do, we, have a, we have correlation coefficient showing us that there is a significant amount of debris as well. And at this point, we did something that, that we had discussed with the, uh, the West Milton tornado, but went ahead and did with this, which is we issued a particularly dangerous situation tornado warning, which includes a thing at the bottom of the warning that says that the damage threat is considerable. Uh, this is an option that's only been available to the National Weather Service for a handful of years, and this was the first time that we had ever used it. Of course, there is another option above that. So what I'm going to show you here is a series of radar images from this, this tornado, basically, as it was looking like it was something out of a meteorology textbook or a training materials that the Weather Service provides for us. A supercell with a hook echo and a debris ball. On velocity, we have rotational velocities as much as 90 knots. That means our radar is sampling winds something over 100 miles an hour in each direction on each side of this tornadic circulation. We see lots of debris on correlation coefficient. Another radar dual pole product I didn't get into, differential reflectivity. We see evidence of debris on that as well. At this point, it's very obvious to us and on our, our NWS chat system that there is a very damaging tornado moving south of Clayton and moving into the Trotwood area at the time of this discussion. So another thing we can do is look up in the atmosphere and see how high that debris is getting. And we see debris at 7,000 feet. We see debris at 12,000 feet. We see debris at 19,000 feet. 
we basically are seeing debris as being lofted four miles in the air. Now I am watching these radar images come in the split second that they arrive to my computer, to my desk at the Weather Service office. And so for, for just a moment, I'm the only person in the world who knows that this tornado is pushing debris four miles into the atmosphere. What do you do with that kind of information? I'm gonna ask another question here to the group. Are you familiar with the meaning of the term tornado emergency? Everyone's probably familiar with the idea of a tornado warning, but a tornado emergency is something different entirely. The first tornado emergency was issued by the National Weather Service on May 3rd of 1999. It was an unofficial enhancement to what would end up being the warning for an F5 tornado that hit Moore, Oklahoma. After that, it was standardized and made official. There have been just short of 200 tornado emergencies issued nationwide since then. This was the second tornado emergency that we ever issued from our office. And the majority of the people who responded indicated that they had heard of the phrase tornado emergency, but some are only familiar with it because of the Memorial Day outbreak. Like I said, it's only the second one we've ever done. The first was in the another tornado outbreak, March 2nd, 2012, that hit our Northern Kentucky and Southern Ohio counties. And it was for what ended up being uh, a, a supercell that produced an EF4 tornado in Kenton County in Kentucky. So a tornado emergency has some very specific criteria that we need for it. We need to know that it's an exceedingly rare situation with a severe threat to human life and catastrophic damage. We need to know there is a confirmed tornado. We need to know that it is a strong tornado. And we are seeing that evidence from the radar and from some of the early spotter and ham radio reports that we're receiving to our office. And so a tornado emergency was issued for Montgomery County. It was drafted up at 10.56 p.m., required a few edits by hand to make sure we get the right locations in there. And then tornado emergency issued 10.57 p.m., first tornado emergency that we'd issued for our Ohio counties and the first of two that we, we issued for this event. Tornado damage threat tag that shows up for a tornado emergency says catastrophic. So this storm then continued to move across Montgomery County. We issued another warning, which would be the updated tornado emergency at 11 o'clock and to extend the tornado warning into Greene County as well, where we knew the threat was going to continue downstream of where the storm was located. At its peak, this tornado actually lofted debris as much as five miles into the air. Now this is an indication that the tornado is very strong. It's an indication to us that it could be EF3 or EF4 in intensity. And we even sort of had that idea in real time. Of course, we don't make that determination for, sh for sure until we get out and survey the damage after the fact. So we were also able to see this storm from the terminal Doppler radar uh, located in Miami County. And the shape that we were able to determine as we scroll up through the atmosphere, as we look higher and higher into the storm, the, the spiraling shapes that you see from this storm, uh, something that you might call a, a vortex hole that is actually, this is the bounded weak echo region, which is basically the main updraft of the storm, but right above where the tornado is, you have these other, these other shapes. And actually to the north of that, there is another radar signature, I've heard it referred to as an owl horn signature, where it's almost like you have a circulation associated with the tornado on the southern end, but you have another circulation that is actually rotating anticyclonically, rotating clockwise way up in the storm on the northern end of the storm. Now here we're looking at probably a couple miles above the surface of the earth, but we see a very strong circulation to the updraft and this other very strange radar feature that we're reserving across northern Montgomery County as well. So the storm continued and the circulation continued as it eventually moved across Montgomery County, crossed I-75, not too far north of downtown Dayton. But we also see that there's this area of outflow that has developed and the tornado is now getting behind the leading edge of the outflow. When that happens, the tornado eventually is going to weaken because it's lost its source of warm and moist air. But it took a while for that to happen. The tornado was still very strong when it crossed I-75 and then eventually neared 
the Montgomery Green County line on, on the far eastern end of Montgomery County. So what happened next? Because another tornado developed. And in fact, these two tornadoes were probably on the ground at the same time as each other for a brief period of time. The Dayton EF4 tornado is located here circled. We can see the very strong circulation, but we're gonna tilt up and see where is the mesocyclone? Where is that rotating updraft above the tornado? And as I look up a little higher in the storm, a little higher in the storm, a little higher in the storm, you can see that the mesocyclone to the right is actually, it's actually very displaced from where the tornado is located at this point. It's actually well further ahead of where the tornado is located. So with that said, this tornado took a bit of a right turn. It was moving mainly west across the county, but then it took a dive, or excuse me, east, but then it took a dive to the southeast and changed direction. So we can look at how that happened because the tornado originally developed underneath the center of this mesocyclone, the rotating updraft of the thunderstorm. But then with time, it got behind it and got in an area where the winds of the mesocyclone were blowing from north to south. And that helped the tornado to make a turn as it crossed Montgomery County and take more of a southward, southeastward component to its motion. But as that mesocyclone got ahead, and as this tornado moved southeast across Montgomery County, sure enough, another tornado developed just before crossing into Greene County. And for a brief period of time, probably less than a minute, both of these tornadoes may very well have been on the ground at the same time. And we track that one across Beaver Creek area. And you can see from the map, Near Riverside is where that sort of that cycle occurred. And then we got another tornado to develop, crossed I-675 and moved through Beaver Creek. And the Beaver Creek tornado very quickly went from not existing to EF3 intensity as it moved across 675 on the far western edge of Greene County. We see the circulation, we see debris, we see all the things that we've seen before and we know the right decision is to continue the tornado warnings out ahead. And so that's what we did. We see the circulation from the terminal Doppler radar in Miami County. Once again, we're dealing with levels of, of the strength of this circulation that are way at the high end of anything we've ever seen from this office. And this tornado was doing EF3 damage at the time. That tornado continued east. It moved north of Xenia, a city very famous for its history with tornadoes. This one did not hit the city. It moved north of it, impacted some areas on the north side, um, eventually dissipating shortly as it, after it crossed US 68 north of Xenia. And then that tornado dissipated, and that was about that was about it for a very brief period of time from that storm. So I'm going to play a loop here, and you can watch the debris ball develop. And then you can watch it develop again as the second tornado forms moving through Beaver Creek. And you can really see the motions of the thunderstorm when you look at this from the perspective of the thunderstorm. And you can see the circulation and the way the, way the, the tornado changes direction and then reforms as a second tornado moving into Greene County. If you look at it on velocity, you can see much the same thing. You can see the tornado make its move to the south and then redevelop once again. Play this through one more time here. Unfortunately, as we're aware, that was not the last tornado we had to deal with. Because while we're dealing with the tornado moving out of Montgomery County into Greene County, we've also got clusters of thunderstorms moving into central Ohio that we're issuing tornado warnings on because they're showing signs of circulation. Did not get any tornadoes to develop, thankfully. But there's another thunderstorm that's developed in Dart County and Miami County and is following right behind the thunderstorm that produced the big tornado. So there's the Beaver Creek tornado right as it's formed and is moving through Greene County. But we've also have this next supercell following right behind it that we're going to issue another tornado warning on. And this tornado developed first there was an EF0 in the Phillipsburg area. So from the, the, the Dayton airport radar, we're able to see that circulation produced a weak tornado in the Phillipsburg area before it then went on kind of between Inglewood and Vandalia to produce a stronger tornado. And at this point, I've, I've shifted warning uh, responsibilities to this storm to Kristen, 
who is following the storm as it produces an EF2 tornado that crosses I-75 just two and a half miles north of where the EF4 tornado moved through. We were wondering, are we going to see a similar cycle with this tornado? Are we going to see the mesocyclone redevelop to the north and a new tornado develop from this one? And the answer is that we did not. Part of the reason for that is you can see the circulation here as it washes out, as that tornado dissipates. But all this red is all winds blowing away from the radar. And this is all colder air that has basically cut off any warmth and moisture moving into this thunderstorm. And that was something that didn't really happen with the first storm, which continued to produce tornadoes over and over and over again. Now, this one did go on to eventually produce one more tornado. Um, but at the moment, its tornado potential had been significantly diminished because of the cold air that was flowing out of the thunderstorm that had sort of changed the environment for it. In central Ohio, we came very close to having some tornadoes with some very strong or some very strong storms that had produced circulations. We had warnings out for several of them. I'm going to show you one that came very close. This is an image from the Columbus Airport radar near the Franklin Licking County line in the Reynoldsburg area. And you can see a hook echo here. And you can see a strong circulation as well. This circulation tracked very close to the radar, so close that we were able to see very carefully um, how strong it was. And that you had only 120 feet off the ground, we're measuring a rotational velocity of about 40 knots or so, maybe 45 to 50 miles an hour. If it produced a tornado, it did not produce enough damage that we were able to confirm one. But it shows you that even for central Ohio, we were very close to having additional tornadoes to be concerned about. So for the, uh, as we go further on ahead, Lots of tornado warnings out, and we're still mainly focused on these two moving through the Dayton area. So if you're if you're now moving into eastern Green County, the Jamestown area, this is the radar image at 11:45 p.m. This is the radar image at 12:21 a.m. You have two supercells, one right after another, that moved through the Jamestown area, and both of them produced tornadoes. I'll track out the first tornado from the first supercell. We'll put the, the dot on the, uh, the velocity image there as it moves through the area. And here's our tornado track as estimated from radar. We'll do the same thing with the second one. Here's where the tornado started. And we can see the circulation move ahead north of Jamestown and then eventually into Fayette County where it dissipates. So two tornado tracks. And here's how it looked like from the actual damage survey two tornadoes from two storms with paths that kind of converged together. Don't know of any other situation, at least in our area, where we've had that kind of thing happen just 45 minutes apart from each other like that. As that storm continued on, this is the first supercell, the, the one that produced the Dayton tornado, produced another tornado in Circleville in Pickaway County with evidence of debris on the radar, produced another one in Tarleton in southeastern Pickaway County, and then produced an EF2, the final tornado that we had to deal with that night in Laurelville in Hocking County, also with evidence of debris on the radar. But we continued issuing warnings also for the back supercell because it still at times showed signs of strong circulation as well. And this storm moved into southwest part of Hocking County with a very strong rotation on, on radar. And we were wondering, did a tornado occur here as well? But this is a very rural area, and we had no reports of any damage from this storm at two in the morning in a very rural area. So we're not sure, but it's possible that something happened, but we were not able to confirm that anything did. So 37 warnings, five hours later, we had finally walked the final storms out of the area that we cover, and the event had come to an end at 2.15 p.m. But that was just just the beginning. I'm going to show you one more radar loop here. And you can see this is the two main supercells, basically the one that moves through Dayton right here. But you can see the other one kind of sneak in from the north. And it's interesting to note how they had sort of different angles of motion and how the, uh, the back supercell had more of a southward component to its motion, at least at first. And then these two supercells continued following one another all the way across our area, occasionally producing tornadoes as they did so. 
The other thing you'll notice is that these two supercells, they never congealed into a big line. They never became much of a wind damage threat. They remained discrete, separate supercells the whole way through. Another thing you could see the supercells on was satellite imagery. You could see them from space. You can see little dimples here, the one on the right from the supercell that produced the West Milton EF3, the one below it, the Dayton EF4, and then the other supercell following behind northwest of that. A little bit later, you can see the two supercells. Again, from space, you can see evidence of them um, from the, as the two supercells kind of combined their, their way together and moved across the area. My story from that night is just one of many. I'd like you to hear from another member of our team. So I'm gonna introduce Kristen, who was another person issuing tornado warnings and helping out with all aspects of this event and give her a chance to share her end of the event. Hey Andy, thanks so much. And uh, thanks everyone for spending an evening with us uh, talking about this event and, and sharing your stories as well. It's, it's so important for us to uh, hear firsthand accounts from those impacted, uh, whether directly or indirectly. Um, as Andy mentioned, I was uh, one of the National Weather Service Wilmington meteorologists uh, on, uh, on staff that night and in operations uh, during the meet of the event. Um, but it wasn't uh, originally designed to be that way. And I'm gonna take you just really quickly through my story and, uh, and how things kind of uh, evolved for me personally uh, in leading up to that event and during the event as well. So, uh, you know, this is kind of a personal reflection. Um, in the days leading up to the event, there was some quiet weather and I was actually on shift and I thought, you know, I'm gonna try to, come up with a creative social media post uh, while on shift to kind of uh, talk about the pattern of storminess that had been ongoing uh, through uh, the first part of May of 2019. So I put together this graphic that I posted to our Facebook and Twitter accounts that talked about the pattern of storminess, but also mentioned, of course, the additional uh, strong to severe thunderstorm threat, both uh, the day before Memorial Day and again on Memorial Day. And of course mentioned that the streak of storminess was likely to continue uh, for the weekend, for the holiday weekend. And then I started to take a look at our schedule. Our work schedule, took a look at the calendar and noticed that I had Sunday and Monday off. So I was kind of planning, at least initially, to have a relaxing weekend and, and, and kind of step away from it for, for a little bit. And uh, you know, even though I was stepping away from the office for a couple of days. Uh, as many meteorologists will tell you, uh, we're never really stepping away from the weather. <laughs> you know, even on our days off, we're, we're checking the convective outlet looks, we're checking the models. And, and of course, this was the initial SPC day two outlook. I took a closer look and I thought, okay, well, hey, we're still in a marginal risk. Uh, I still get to uh, enjoy my Memorial Day and not worry about uh, about it because it, it looks like a kind of a lower end uh, risk just based on the convective outlook alone, which of course that changed uh, even that following morning. And, uh, and I'm starting to think, well, okay, things are escalating quickly. And as any meteorologist again would tell you, um, we like looking at weather data. We like looking at, at model data, interrogating the event, maybe not, even not when we're at the office. We do it in our personal time because weather is our passion. So I kind of started to take a look at some things. Meanwhile, planning uh, my afternoon, which was a Memorial Day barbecue, which I was excited about. And uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm at that barbecue. I'm eating some some good, uh, you know, food on, from the grill. And, and then my phone rings. And it's the office. And it is the lead forecaster who was on that day. And uh, he cut right to the chase, he says, we're growing increasingly concerned about a high end severe weather event this evening. And uh, they were looking for, for some extra people to come into the office. And he wanted to know if I was available. And of course I said, no problem, I'll be there. I'll, I'll, I'll be where you need me to be. So of course, at this point I start kind of uh, not looking so much at my burger, but looking at, uh, at radar, and of course, uh, you know things are already starting to to initiate uh, across Illinois and Indiana. So, 
the good news is from our perspective is we had a, at least a, a couple hours to kind of watch things evolve before it entered our area and uh, started looking at some computer models and and uh, again as andy had mentioned uh, very clearly there was a trend in the high resolution data that afternoon to keep the storms a little bit more discreet as they entered the local area so i thought well that's not good so i get in my car and of course there are a thousand different things running through my mind you know what's going to go on with this event what's my role going to be do i need to have someone take care of my dog rosie is this going to be a 10 or 12 hour shift uh, you know sometimes you just don't really know uh, when you're heading into the office and, and potentially dealing with an event maybe not even of this magnitude uh, but but uh, you know a more standard severe weather event so i arrive at the office i get the weather briefing from the lead forecaster and um, he kind of assigns me he's like i want you to do mesoanalysis which is diagnosing the environment and andy uh, really did a great job at uh, showing what the environment was like for these storms. And he uh, he also said, I want you to handle our social media for the remainder uh, of the night. So at 822, I sent out the first tweet that I had personally sent. And I know that we had sent many others uh, through uh, the afternoon and early part of the evening. But as we progressed through the next five hours, uh, you know, I was busy sending messages. And this was a very important part of the event, trying to send enhanced messaging, trying to differentiate this event from every other event that we uh, have dealt with in the past several years. We needed a way to kind of message that this one was different. And uh, we tried to do that through our social media. Um, and, and I think that, uh, that that helped at least some people uh, get a better sense of exactly the type of event that we were dealing with um, because our social media uh, we don't usually use uh, terminology like we did in some of our posts that evening and as andy mentioned i also uh, was was on radar for a little bit issuing some warnings issued a couple warnings some severe thunderstorm warnings some tornado warnings and um you know this was all kind of bundled within a a five or six hour period and so my lesson learned and something that i kind of want to share with everyone here uh you know you you hear it a million times but I, I can't stress it enough it's to always be prepared for whatever may be thrown your way um you know when i was kind of enjoying the time off that sunday and the first part of that monday i had no idea that i was going to be involved in in the region's uh, largest and most destructive tornado outbreak uh, just just a mere day or hours later um, in, in terms of trying to uh, you know get the message out and get the warnings out and and that really is kind of you know that message of always being prepared it applies so much more than just like you have to be prepared for anything when you uh, come into the office severe weather can prompt the need to take action when it is least convenient to do so. And luckily, as I kind of showed a little bit, I was staying weather aware, even when I wasn't technically uh, at, at the office. I was kind of keeping a, a lookout for the convective outlooks. I was uh, looking at computer models. And so I knew in the back of my mind that there was a chance, that there was a chance that I would be involved in some capacity with this event. Um, and, and certainly it ended up being that way. And then of course, with the, with the 15 hour survey day, the next day. So that's kind of my, my quick story. And, um, I do want to, uh, go ahead and send it back to Andy and, uh, Andy, uh, take it away. Thanks very much, Kristen. Thanks for, for sharing that story. Um, certainly your efforts were amongst the many others in our office, uh, we're very appreciated that night and going on into the future. And speaking of going on into the future, as soon as the event ends, we're not done. We have to begin the storm survey process. And I wanna take you through what that storm survey process is like. So here's the map of all our tornado warnings and I'll overlay a map of the areas basically that we had identified were the, were the, most, uh, the most of interest that we would be trying to do storm surveys for and try to plan out that first day of storm surveys with multiple teams going out in multiple locations. We had our first team going out to Montgomery County 
to try and get into the, the worst affected areas, only to not really be able to get into the worst affected areas because the damage was so severe. We had one team that went to the Beaver Creek area in Greene County. One team went covered many, many miles of tornado track, including EF3 track in Mercer County at a very long distance from the office. Another team, including Kristen, that went to storms in Pickaway and Hocking counties to look at the damage from those. And I went in a helicopter to uh, fly over the most affected areas with the Ohio State Highway Patrol. Now, you, you can't determine an EF rating from the air, but it can help you get an overall layout of what you're looking at and how severe the damage is in multiple places. As this is all going on, as we're going into surveys on our first day after the event, there was also a severe thunderstorm watching effect and we had to have some people at the office issuing severe thunderstorm warnings, including the northern part of our forecast area uh, north of Dayton, uh, as this was all going on as well. So the Ohio State Highway Patrol actually landed right out in front of our office and I waved by to our radar tower as we went out to go look at the tornado damage in the Dayton area. So here's the path that we took, uh, that we flew basically to cover the, the, the worst of the tornadoes. Um, as I zoom in a little bit on it, I'm gonna put points on the map to mark out uh, the tornado tracks that we ended up with the final surveys. Um, but I'm also gonna put points on the map to show you all the, each one of these is a piece of damage that I identified from the air. Uh, it's so many that you can't even see the tornado track underneath it. There's just so much damage. So we're going to start in the Brookville area where the first damage that was recorded from the EF4 was located just a couple miles inside the Preble County line. And it was just a handful of trees down at this location. But then the damage got more significant as you got into Brookville, EF2 type damage being done to homes in a relatively newer subdivision, uh, homes that were relatively well built as well. As you got further and got closer to Trotwood, we started seeing evidence of EF3 level damage, significant removal of walls, upper stories, roofs and things, although in interior rooms still mainly left in place. I've always thought that pictures like these, to be able to see the colors painted on the walls of people's bedrooms is a very strange and unnerving thing that you don't really like to see at all. So the majority of properties in this area were probably high-end EF2 damage with swaths of EF3 level damage, uh, likely caused by individual um, smaller scale vortices that rotate around within a tornado that can cause enhanced swaths of damage throughout the area. Now, this is a, a 20 mile long tornado track. Um, probably 15 of those 20 miles had at least EF2 level damage and probably 11 of those 20 miles had some EF3 level damage mixed in with it. But the EF4 damage was a relatively small area on the banks of the Stillwater River in the Shiloh area. One of the first things you'll notice from here is that you've got a, this huge swath of trees that is probably 1200 feet or so wide that is completely decimated. And across the river from those trees, you see, um, apartment buildings, multi-family residential structures, relatively well built that have experienced a significant amount of damage in addition to the significant tree damage that occurred right there. Uh, some pictures from the ground of the damage to these apartment buildings from Dayton Skywarn. And so this was the area where the EF4 rating was determined for this tornado. And the tree damage included trees being bent over, trees being debarked, trees being nubbed, um, sort of just, just left with little sharp points left on them. It was extensive, significant tree damage as well. So the combination of those two factors um, gave us confidence to use the EF scale. Now, this is, the, this is right out of the EF scale, the enhanced Fujita scale that we use to determine a tornado's rating and wind speed based on the damage it does after the fact. And so we looked at apartments uh, the category for that, and where you have most top store walls collapsed, that gives you a wind speed of about 158. If you have almost total destruction of the top two stories, you have 180. Um, so we're probably kind of in the middle of those, which can get you about 170. Combined with sort of corroborating evidence from the tree damage, that is an EF4 level tornado on the enhanced Fujita scale. And that's how we made that determination. That tornado continued onward producing EF3 to eventually kind of some, some higher end EF2 damage as it crossed I-75 through the north 
Dayton, or the old North Dayton area, significant destruction through here, um, not just to homes, but to, I think, a school building, some commercial facilities in the area as well. And then after that, it began to, to weaken a little bit more quickly as it got behind that colder air that I mentioned. Um, so you can see the first tornado uh, where it dissipates and the other one where it forms basically due north of it as this whole cycle is occurring and the two tornadoes kind of hand off from one to the other, both of which just south of the Air Force Museum that's located at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Now the Beaver Creek tornado, the EF3, went from uh, went to EF3 level and produced significant damage almost immediately after touching down, within a mile or two. From there, after that EF3 damage had been done in the Beaver Creek area, most of the rest of the track was at the EF, uh, EF1, EF2 level uh, as you went out and got north of Xenia into more slightly, slightly less densely populated areas. Um, when you're looking for tornado damage from the air in, in areas where it's not quite as heavy, sometimes you're looking for things like tarps or you're, you're, you're looking for plywood or certainly if there are signs of some debris in a field um, like this. This was the last, the last damage we found and it was an old farm building that had some, some roofing material kicked off of it. Now from the second supercell that moved through the area, this is damage from the Phillipsburg EF0, which is the only tornado that our office has ever initially confirmed solely based on an aerial survey. It's because we, we found the damage from the helicopter. Now the grain bin in a field is the kind of thing we deal with more frequently with tornadoes than some of the other more significant damage that we've seen from this one. In Northeast Montgomery County, this is the Inglewood, Vandalia, Miller Lane type area. That was an EF2 with some evidence of some pretty significant home damage in certain spots. As you got to the area near the Benchwood Wise Interchange on I-75, more significant damage, including to church, to uh, the amusement facility that's on the east side uh, that took a very long time to get this reopened. When you have roof damage like this, you also are going to have water damage on the inside, aside from just the structural issues. Now this tornado continued onward across Northeast Montgomery County, produced a, another, another one of these very large swaths of significant damage to trees. Probably, probably EF2 level damage to, to these trees in this area, but right next to it was a trailer park, the Sunny Acres Trailer Park. And you can see just how close um, significant tree damage was to that trailer park. We're talking less than, honestly, probably less than 500 feet away. And obviously it would be a very much worse story if instead of those trees it had gone through the trailer park instead, but we had uh, we had the tornado moving on the, on the right side of that line, uh, just, just the way things worked out. And that's very good. So after day one, we confirmed a total of, I believe, eight tornadoes after the first day, including the, the worst of them in the Dayton area, in addition to the ones out in Pickaway and Hawking counties. Now, one of those tornadoes, the middle one of the three that hit the Tarleton area, had a very personal impact on another weather service meteorologist. And with that, I'm gonna invite Nate McGinnis to tell his story about the tornado in Pickaway County. Yeah, thanks, Andy. I appreciate your scientific uh, explanation of the of the situation, and I also appreciate Kristen's view with regards to working at the weather office. Now, as Andy said, uh, I am a National Weather Service employee. However, I was not a weather service employee at the office in Wilmington, Ohio, at the time of the outbreak. So. Their stories are somewhat unique to mine, but as Andy suggested, I had a much more personal with regards to the impacts themselves. Now, this image right here is an image of the house that I spent most of my memory making years um, throughout my young adult days and, and through grade school and stuff like that. So this, this uh, property that you're, that you're seeing in this image is very special to me and we're gonna kind of go through uh, what happened uh, that evening. So where was I at the time? Well, that night I was actually working at my 
uh, first National Weather Service office, which is located in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, like some of these other folks, I was on duty at the time. Uh, I was scheduled to work the overnight shift, uh, the midnight shift. It was a very quiet evening down in the Jacksonville, Florida area. And I just happened to see a couple messages, a couple tweets uh, showing these storms moving into the Dayton area. And as I'm sitting there working on my quiet weather forecast, I see these tornadoes develop, these supercells that are resulting in large damaging tornadoes. And, you know, I kind of zero in and focus on, you know, what, what's going on because I'll be honest, I was completely disconnected. I, I didn't really know that this was, you know, advertised. And, and as Andy showed, it wasn't, you know, advertised extremely, you know, in, in an advance that, you know, would have my attention. So I knew that the tornadoes were ongoing. I'm watching this all unfold while I'm sitting in the office and I'm growing increasingly concerned, even at my distance of over 600 miles away, that these tornadoes are headed toward the area that I grew up in, which is the Circleville, Tarleton area. Uh, I grew up in both of those uh, towns south of Columbus. And I'm just looking at the broad track of some of these cells and they're headed east, southeast, right toward the area that, that I know and love. Well, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the cell that moved into Pickaway County. Now this cell has the history that Andy showed you, which was it produced the Brookville, uh, Troutwood, Dayton, Beaver Creek tornadoes. And I know that cells that remain discreet and, and remain in the environment that's favorable for producing tornadoes is a, you know, a kind of a scary thing. So this cell was was disorganized for quite a while, actually, wasn't producing, you know, any tornadoes that, that we know of for, for quite a while. And I'm just, you know, watching this and, you know, I'm I'm not really enjoying the, the shape that it still has. It's still discreet. We don't see this giant hook echo or anything on it, um, but it still is organized and it's still in an environment that's capable of producing tornadoes. Well, after this scan at 1039, my concern started to increase, and so did the concern of the, the radar operators at Wilmington, Ohio, because a tornado warning was issued for the storm as it started to reorganize. You know, as Andy showed you with reflectivity and, and velocity, things started to grow, become growingly concerning for the Circleville and Logan Elm Village areas. And, you know, I'm sitting there texting my brother, and I'm like, this is not, this is not good, you know? And uh, there was definitely increasing concern. Well. We're really going to kind of focus in here as the cell moves into the circle area. And one fortunate thing here is that while the entire storm was over the circle area, the part that was going to produce a tornado actually passed to the south of Circleville, a much larger population area. And the tornado formed just west of US 23 uh, near Logan Elm Village. And you can see the circulation tighten up. The, the orange circle is sort of the, the, the mesocyclone that associated with the supercell and that much tighter red circle is focused on the tornado and, and as it developed there uh, just south of Logan Elm Village. So I'm, I'm keeping an eye on this thing. I'm obviously grateful that it's you know passing south. The, this area that the tornado touched down in is, is much more rural. It has a lot of you know industrial uh, facilities and there's not as much population uh, with regards to dense, densely packed houses. However, that little green dot is where my family lives. I have uh, my parents live at this location. I have siblings that live in this location. So after the storm passes south of Circleville, my attention is now really focused on that location that I showed you with that picture from the initial slide. And so from 1057 to uh, just after 11 o'clock, there is a well-defined hook echo. I see a, a very strong velocity signature and my concern continues to grow for uh, my family. Well, I, I was on the phone with them throughout. You know, I told them way when the, the storms were over in Dayton that I didn't really like the path of the storms. I, I called them when I saw the tornado developing south of Circleville, and I said, you know, you guys really should should take this situation seriously. And and um, I continue to track this. And and this was really the moment uh, at 11:05 when I said, okay, enough is enough. There's a debris signature still on radar. You guys got about three minutes to to hunker down and, and get ready for this thing. Now, as Andy, you know, suggested or, or said with regards to radar technology, radar technology 
goes, you know, the lowest beam kind of goes up with with height away from the radar. Well, this location is is fairly far away. It's probably 5,000 to 6,000 feet, um, you know, above the ground. So while I see this tornado signature, I'm not really super confident as we head into this frame. So I see this kind of higher enhanced, you know, velocity. I see a, a weak debris reflection still. But I'm not really sure. So I had just talked to my parents three minutes before and I said, you know, seek shelter and, and do everything that you're supposed to do. And I let a couple minutes go by. The signature continued to, you know, weaken. I, I wasn't really confident that, you know, the tornado was still on the ground. There's no more uh, strong CC. The velocity is weakened. And, you know, I, I call my, my dad and, you know, it takes a couple rings for it to, to, you know, for it to answer. And I fully expect him to say, we got nothing, you know, as always, we got nothing. But uh, I instead heard three words that I'll never forget, which were, we got hit. And personally, you know, seven, 800 miles away, um, those three words hit me down to my core because all my life, I grew up in this house. Most of my life, I guess, I grew up in this house. And that those were three words I never expected to hear were, we got hit. And then the, the questions of, well, what do you mean you got hit? What is that like a couple trees down? You know, I, I didn't see a really super strong tornado. So, I mean, that was at least some part of, of my emotions that, that held me in check. But nothing could have prepared me for what I was about to hear and later see. Now, just a little history on this house. This was an Amish house that, that we, we moved into and had spent many years renovating and making it our own house. The, the porch was, was mostly brand new from the, the very deck to the, to the roof all the way around. Um, we had spent years you know, remolding and, and, and fixing this and making this our own, watching the trees grow. And in the matter of really just a, a few seconds, all of that work turned into the picture that you see below. Now, the house isn't leveled, right? It, it wasn't a super strong tornado, um, but this is when weather really got personal for me, is knowing that I'm down in Jacksonville, Florida, and my family just went through this. So what I'm gonna do is, is you know, interesting, interestingly enough, uh, and really kind of, I wouldn't say humorous, but uh, it's incredibly ironic that my brother, uh, Tim, he, he actually was out there, him and his family were out there the evening before, and they took the drone up and took aerial photos. There were some really cool thunderstorms with the rainbow, and he took, you know, these aerial images of the entire property and was just out flying his drone around. And, un, you know, unknowingly, the fact that the next evening that a tornado would go through and completely change the landscape. So I'm just gonna go through a series of before and after pictures from as close as a perspective that I could gain um, from the drone videos that he took the day before and the drone videos that he took the, the, the day following the, the tornado. So this is from the south end. Um, we're gonna be, you can see, you can't really see the house, uh, but just really the tree damage is, is kind of the significant uh, factor here. So there's the, the tree damage. Um, Basically, the tornado, from from my understanding, is that the the tornado basically came right toward where the, the the vantage point of the camera is. You can see how all the trees are kind of leaned toward the north um, on the south side of the house, and you can see the damage there. Here's that picture that I had on the first slide, and let's see how things have changed from that perspective. So we lost, I would say, 90% of the of the I mean, 100% of the large trees that were around the house. Um, there's a couple of small little trees that, that still remain, but this is a good view for showing you where the, where the track of the, of the tornado actually went through. So you have the, uh, the tornado likely went right over the, the, the top of the house. Um, and, and if you maybe didn't notice that there was this nice, nice little horse barn, we had three horses out there at the time and that horse barn, um, was completely demolished and, uh, sent across the field. And then from this perspective, this is now from the north side of the house. And once again, you can see that beautiful roof uh, from the from the porch uh, completely removed um, somewhere out in the field. The pieces are, are laying down and, you know, I'm sitting here. I ended up staying up throughout my entire midnight shift. I stayed up till as long as possible the next day as as these images were coming in. And I'm and I'm just floored. I 
to be honest, I'm, I'm seeing pictures of this was my uh, sister's room. And you can see on the second floor, the entire uh, north or south wall has almost failed. And, and I believe that if that wall would have actually failed, the damage to the second floor house, uh, second floor story would have been much more significant. And just to sort of wrap up here, again, this is a place that, you know, I spent most of my, my life, well, you know, we, we worked on this yard and, and you know, the buildings and, and we, did, we did so much to this place and, and just in a blink of an eye, it was, it was essentially all ruined. And we, you know, we really kind of all faced that question of, man, you know, Nate, he's grown up in our house this entire time. He loves weather. And this is exactly why I do what I do. I, I work for the National Weather Service because one, I, I am passionate about weather. I love weather, but I know that it does this. I know that it, it wrecks people's lives. It can lead to injuries. It can lead to fatalities. Um, but this is where I grew up. I mean, these are my actual photos of lightning from this house. I, I took pictures out the window. I, I watched every storm go by the house and it had all changed in the blink of an eye. And I, I've always felt very personalized with weather and, and it always devastates me when people I know and I see other people suffering because of it. But it got really personal for me here. And, uh, you know, I can't I still can't really fathom that this is what, you know, actually happened. But the good side to all of this was that the tornado was on the weaker side. Possessions were ruined and and needed replaced. Um, my dad sustained a few, uh, you know, cuts and, and slices from flying debris. But outside of that, everyone was here. Everyone was still here. No pets were lost. No horses. No uh, cats. No uh, no family members. And we were able to to rebuild. And this is where my my family now live today. So. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share my personal story. I know so many of you that are attending tonight probably have similar stories, ones that, you know, may even be more significant than mine. But just just know that we go through this, too. And it just it just drives us even further to make sure that that we're doing the best that we can every day to serve um, to serve the area that that we live in, that we have family and friends uh, and, and coworkers that that live there, too. So. Uh, thank you for your time, and uh, we'll move back to move back to Andy. All right, Nate. Thanks so much for sharing your you know your very personal story of of how how this uh, you know even even for for us this is this can be something that affects us um, can affect us emotionally and it can affect us in ways uh, certainly physically um, and in terms of our property as well. So thank you for sharing that, and. That was just the first day of surveys. Again, that was one of the one of the eight tornadoes we confirmed from the first day, but we had to get back out there on the second day and survey Miami County, survey Dark County, survey some of our northern counties um, and and uh, Jamestown area and Greene County as well. So I went and did a ground survey of the EF3 tornado that moved through uh, West Milton, Ludlow Falls, Laura area of Miami County. Uh, so here's here's sort of us driving back and forth across the path of it because we're trying to find all the damage points that the tornado caused and then end up plotting those on the map. And then, of course, that turns into a tornado track when we're all done with it. So, of course, how do you determine the width of a tornado? When you have so many damage points, uh, it's it's very difficult. The, your, your goal is really to focus on the most focused damage is most clearly associated with the circulation of a tornado because um, there's there's other other winds in the storm that may cause damage as well. But it, it's a very difficult thing to do sometimes. Um, for example, is this tornado three quarters of a mile wide? Is this tornado a mile wide? Uh, we ended up going more on the on the lower end of that scale, but that's still a very, very wide tornado to, to measure out on, on the ground. So this was an EF3. There was uh, it was mainly because of a of a significant enough combination of of roof removal, um, wall removal on some upper floors. Um, this was this was 36 hours after the outbreak, and the roads we were driving, some of them still looked basically like this. Um, here's here's one of the ones that was able to to get into the about 140 mile per hour range on the enhanced Fujita scale. Um, this is an area that's it's not densely populated, but pretty much every every road that cuts through has got a bunch of homes on it. So there were there were a lot of properties and a lot of people that were affected 
from this tornado uh, in West Milton. Um, and this is from the ground, seeing up close and personal is the, the worst tornado damage that I have surveyed. Uh, you, when you can see the, the destruction across the fields and the amount of debris that's been that's been thrown across. Uh, the, the, some of the tree damage, of course, was pretty significant as well. So along the way, we stumbled upon um, a, a, a mobile home, a couple of mobile homes that had been very significantly damaged um, as a little bit later in the tornado track, kind of kind of closer to the end of the tornado track. And there's one there's one building here. Pretty much all of the external walls were gone. Uh, the whole thing had been shifted. Um, the, the, the debris from this place had been thrown out into the field as well. Um, but you had this one interior room, the, the interior bathroom of this home that was still standing. And the two people in this home, well, we spoke to one of them. They took shelter in this bathroom. Again, the, the last remaining forward facing walls that were still standing from this uh, modular home, they took shelter in there and had only very, you know, my, minor cuts and scrapes type type injuries, and they made it out okay in in a, in a structure that was otherwise basically completely demolished. So when we tell people for safety's sake, small interior room on the lowest floor of a building, this is a, an amazing example of why and how even in the face of significant destruction, a place like that can keep you safe. So after the next day, day two of surveys, we confirmed whole bunch more tornadoes. In fact, nine more bringing our total up to 17 for the event. One of those 17 is a tornado in Waynesfield in Auglaize County. Uh, this tornado was captured on security camera from the Waynesfield Goshen schools, the, the, the high school at that location. And it didn't do a lot of damage, but it did some tree damage and there was some minor damage to the school as well. And because we because it's at night, we don't have very many videos that are really, really worth looking at from any of these tornadoes. But this one, the way you can see the swirl and the, the damage and the, the tree debris and stuff getting blown across the parking lot, uh, it, it's really kind of kind of remarkable just because it's the only really good quality video we have of that kind of thing. So we got back to work with more surveys. On day three, we sent the team back into the hardest hit areas in, in the Montgomery County area as well as a couple other locations elsewhere. This was the day that we got up to 18 total, but also made the EF4 upgrade, which was originally EF3 for the for the Dayton area. And we upgraded that to EF4 after all the damage had finally been examined. We also wrapped up with another Oglays County tornado after investigating the, the data a little bit more and ended up with our total of 19 plus tornadoes confirmed by the offices in Pittsburgh and Charleston, West Virginia. And those tornadoes brought the state of Ohio's total up to a total of 21 total tornadoes. And we still weren't quite done. In fact, we looked at a couple other places, for example, in the Cedarville area in Greene County, where there just wasn't enough there to be able to confirm anything. We got a damage report weeks after the fact from someone in Northern Wayne County in Indiana. It, was, it had already been cleaned up and it was much too late to do anything with either, but there was some damage there. Uh, if you remember, we had that circulation in the Reynoldsburg area uh, on the Franklin Licking County line, and that was also very close to producing a tornado, if, if not just didn't produce any damage. So the, the point is, the total of 21 is the absolute best we can do. We made no additional confirmations, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there, there couldn't have been one or two more in spots, but ultimately when we confirm tornadoes, we're trying to do the best we can and confirm things that we can say with pretty degree, good degree of certainty are tornadoes uh, and, and we do the best we can with that. Now, of course, that gives us a total 21 in the state of Ohio, including the first EF4 in the state of Ohio since the Millbury tornado in the Toledo area in June 5th of 2010. First EF4 we had in our forecast area since the Piner, Kentucky tornado during the March 2nd, 2012 outbreak. It was the first EF3 anywhere in either Ohio or our forecast area since the Cedarville tornado in Greene County in 2014. The total time it took to get all of this information calculated out was close to three, close to about, about three weeks of work where we're still making some adjustments to the tornado tracks. We're still changing some of the times and the location and just getting it as absolutely accurate as we possibly can. Uh, and finally, we're able to, on June 11th, 
sort of put the official records of this outbreak to rest and move on from there. Of course, tornadoes weren't the only hazard that day. Um, this is a map of insurance claims, kind of a zoomed out map. You'll notice where the tornado tracks are. Those are in black and a whole lot, bunch of claims from those. But you'll also notice this big swath of claims in Huber Heights area, uh, Fairborn area, even north, north of Xenia, Yellow Springs area, um, from golf ball size hail that also produced a significant amount of damage from this event. But I think that with all the tornado damage, sometimes that is, an, is another sort of meteorological aspect that sometimes gets forgotten about, but that was pretty significant as well. So to look at our warning performance from that event. Now, I mentioned we actually issued 37 tornado warnings in total. In fact, we had five different people that issued tornado warnings that night, which is which is a lot, um, but it was necessary. There was enough work for all of us to do. Now, those tornado warnings, I'll put the, the tornadoes on the map underneath, kind of underneath the warning so you can, you can see this here. Um, 19 total tornadoes in our forecast area. It's combined track length of about 100 miles, a combined uh, track duration of about three hours worth of tornadoes. And Every mile and every minute of every tornado had a warning out in advance in this event with a probability of detection of 100%. The lead time on the initial tornado touchdowns averaged about 15 minutes, uh, ranged anywhere up to 34 minutes in some cases. All of the EF3 damage areas had at least 12 minutes of lead time and the Dayton area EF4 damage had 34 minutes of lead time after the initial tornado warning and eight minutes of lead time after the tornado emergency was issued. We always review our performance after every single severe weather event. It should go without saying that there are times where we find things we can improve on. For events like this, uh, of this size, of this magnitude, it's critically important for us to be accurately giving people the time they need to make the kinds of decisions that can save their lives and their families' lives. And from this event, we hope that we accomplished that goal and we believe that we did. And we, we, we believe it says very good things about the science and about the weather service warning program when that's all working good. So I wanna ask a question about receiving the warnings because warnings are only good if they are received, understood and acted upon. So for this event, what was the primary way, I and mean, probably multiple ways, what was the primary way that you received warning information during the Memorial Day tornado outbreak? And if 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 you maybe weren't directly involved in it, then I guess I would say go ahead and answer is what was the primary way that you typically receive warning information in general? There are certainly, there's certainly other options other than the ones on the poll, but I certainly think that, that this probably covers the majority of uh, the majority of the ways that people receive warning information. Okay. So the, the first three options, cell phone alerts, TV and local news, and weather radio are the ones that it seems like most people. Some people do use social media. There is a very small, a, a very small response indicating outdoor warning sirens, which, which of course is good as, as we'll get into in a second. Um, that's not a primary method for receiving warning information. Um, so uh, I wanna talk a little bit about some of these methods now. So many different ways. Now, social media. Um, just tell you, we had in the in the day of the event and in the follow the total three days of the event and after the event, we had a total of close to four million views on our tweets, including things like the tornado warnings, which which some of those had over a hundred thousand views on their own. The cell phone alerts, the wireless emergency alerts that got to everybody's cell phone if you are within a tornado warning polygon. Um, of course, weather radio. We're going to talk about the media in a second here, but weather radio is another another important aspect. But I also want to mention real quick the whole outdoor warning sirens thing. Now, some communities have them, other communities don't have them. Um, it's not really our place to get into that. That's a that's a local decisions that are that are made by people in in their local communities. But in terms of receiving warnings. There are definitely still some people, and I'm glad to see not very many here uh, in this webinar, but there are definitely some people who, who still kind of equate tornado warning to sirens going off, even though there are more accurate, more reliable, more modern ways that warnings can be received by people. And we want people to have those more accurate, modern ways, and most importantly, have multiple ways of receiving warning 
information day or night because this event tells you that day or night can be just that important i want to get into why why this event which was very bad but in terms of, of course of things like loss of life it could have been much worse and some of us were very worried that it could have been much worse i'm going to cover a couple of things with this i got three things one it was memorial day evening yeah it was a holiday but in the evening at 9 10 11 i think a lot of people are at home in relative safety and I'm going to use Kristen's little calendar example here because she was off work over Memorial Day weekend. But like a lot of people, I believe, they're getting ready to go back in on Tuesday. So a lot of people are at home limiting their exposure to locations and scenarios where sheltering would be more difficult because they're at home in decent structure somewhere where they're able to take shelter. And another thing that kind of goes along with that is what types of structures were affected. Again, we had 100 miles worth of tornado track here, but very few mobile or modular homes were actually affected by these tornadoes. Not, not zero, but very few. Um, and even when you have EF2, EF3 damage on moderately well-built homes to well-built homes, it's not going to result in complete destruction. There will be places where if you are taking shelter, in the places you should be taking shelter, you're probably going to come out of it okay. And obviously that's not necessarily the case when you're dealing with mobile homes, but we had very few mobile homes or modular homes that were impacted from this event. And that's certainly something that probably helped out. Number three is early coverage. And I'm not, I don't mean this obviously wasn't something where we had multiple days in advance where we were beating the drum about tornadoes, but the first warning for the Dayton metropolitan area, if you remember, was actually for Wayne County, Indiana at 8.59 p.m., a good 60 to 90 minutes before the worst tornadoes, Salina, West Milton, Dayton, Trotwood, Beaver Creek actually developed. And that increases the visibility significantly well before the worst of those tornadoes hit. And puts our broadcast meteorologist partners on the air, wall-to-wall -wall coverage. The, the whole visibility of the event just increased when that happened, and I think it helped people to be aware. Now, the weather service is just one part of that process. We communicate information in, in ways that is, is not necessarily the ways that people best interpret it. The people who communicate that information in better ways communicate it in ways that people can understand and put it put it in, in terms to their street level, to their locations and things like that. That's why our broadcast meteorologist colleagues did so much good work, not just during the event, um, but from going from, from the meteorology, from the hard boiled science to risk communication, to becoming almost spokespeople and trusted voices for their communities. And there are a couple of them that I would like you all to hear from tonight. So I will first invite McCall Rideggs to say a few words uh, about the impact from this event on her. Well, thank you, Andy. Um, first of all, thank you guys uh, at the Weather Service guys uh, and gals for everything that you guys did for the Memorial Day tornado outbreak and um, all the other severe weather events that we have throughout the year. And I think that you spoke to it very well as that this is a partnership you know, it's something that broadcast meteorologists and the Weather Service and all of the other emergency um, personnel work together in these type of situations. And had it not been for Andy and everyone at the Weather Service issuing these warnings, we would not be able to communicate the message to the public. And just as it is a moment in time for everyone that's watching now to reminisce um, on their own of what happened that night, uh, the broadcast meteorologists, I know that we all have spoken with each other at one time or another to talk about what it was like for us on air. And I think what stands out to me most from that night is learning the science of radar technology and having now that dual pole technology to be able to understand what's happening um, on radar and not physically being there it can be hard to handle especially in a situation like this where you have multiple tornado warnings at the same time and needing to get that information out and realizing in that moment that there is debris happening because of these tornadoes coming through can be hard to take. But, um, you know, 
being able to communicate that to the public and then learning afterward that the message was heard and that people did what they were supposed to do and take cover when these storms were barreling down is why I do what I do and is um, a lot of value in what I do and why I continue to do it. So I, I'm just going to keep this really brief. I just want to say thank you, Andy, and to everybody at the Weather Service for what you guys did. And um, we're here and we're going to continue to keep that partnership going to keep the Miami Valley safe. Well, thanks so much. Uh, that That's exactly the key. We'll keep that partnership going because we're, we all got the same end goals in mind. And so I also want to bring in Brian Davis to say a, a few words on, on his thoughts on, on the outbreak. All right. Thanks, Andy. Great presentation. Really have enjoyed it. Um, my thoughts that day, um, Carly uh, Smith was working. She was new. She'd been here about four or five months at that point. And uh, Carly uh, worked in Wichita Falls, Texas, went to school in Lubbock. So we had a person here who was straight out of Tornado Alley and uh, really had a lot of experience with, as McCall was talking about, all the radar data, uh, looking for the debris signatures. It was fantastic. When I was on the air, she was pulling up all the information uh, getting it there, it's like, wow, that's what I would pull up. And and, and right there it was to, to get it on the air. Uh, the things I remember about that day, I went out that morning. I'm a cyclist. It was a 50-mile bike ride. We rode from Centerville up to Yellow Springs for breakfast. And I remember the air mass that morning, very pleasant. It's like, wow, this is not a day you would be expecting severe weather, even as a meteorologist, if you didn't look at the weather maps and see what was going on. Uh, we had that warm front move through in the afternoon. I remember there was a rotating storm. I think there was even a severe thunderstorm morning that went out for, I believe it was Clinton County. That was about 4.30 in the afternoon. And I was sort of like Kristen there. I saw our hamburgers. We had uh, barbecued chicken on the grill at that time. And I thought, uh-oh, I'm going to be heading into work here very soon. But that storm did weaken as it, as it moved off to the uh, east and southeast. So Carly kept me in touch through the evening. Uh, let me know there was a severe weather potential coming. That was about eight o'clock. She let me know there were a lot of warnings in effect. So I got here right about uh, 9.05 and the first warning had come out right around nine o'clock for Wayne County. Carly was on the air at that time with the Wayne County warning. And uh, then I jumped in about a half hour later after uh, she covered that warning. Uh, the big concern we had, or at least that I had as I'm doing this, was I thought nobody's going to be paying attention on a holiday. Although, as you pointed out, it ended up being that was a good thing, especially the end of the holiday weekend. Also, we've had so many EF zeros where we're on the air nonstop that I was afraid people are going to think, oh, here we go again. Uh, another one of those warnings where we never see anything happen. And this time we're talking about a major a weather event. So I was afraid, you know, people are, we have all these EF zeros knocking down corn stalks and, and sheds in a field. And all of a sudden here we have a totally different situation. Uh, the big uh, issue we had was covering multiple violent tornadoes. Uh, we were so focused, for example, on the storm coming out of Dark County into Western Miami County uh, that we had sort of tunnel vision. All of a sudden here comes a warning out uh, for Preble County and Montgomery County. And uh, that was probably the biggest challenge we had was staying on top of the multiple tornadoes that were mo moving through. And uh, the one thing I just I, I remember hitting hard was that these are very dangerous tornadoes. These are not the typical tornado warnings we have and that these tornadoes also at that time were striking a major metropolitan area. Uh, when the event had wrapped up, I told our news director after seeing some of the damage, we had a picture of a four-story apartment building. It was missing a wall. I thought if people did not take uh, shelter, get to the lowest level, they were probably blown out of that apartment complex. I told her, expect a couple dozen dead in the morning, hundreds of injuries. And I was totally shocked when I woke up later that morning that there was only one death in Mercer County and one person who was missing in Montgomery County. Uh, so that was that was just incredible that that the people did listen to the warnings uh, from you guys from on air, however they got it, and and they did take uh, shelter from the storm. One personal note before I wrap it up: after all this was done at 4 a.m., I'm sitting at home. I read a text from my son, and it says, "Woo, that was close." 
and it was at that point that I, I hadn't even realized that he was in the vicinity of one of the tornadoes, the Beaver Creek tornado. He lived in Fairborn off of National Road. The tornado passed about three quarter miles south of his apartment. He could see the electric arc flashes uh, as the storms went through. And again, I saw we only had 2% of people uh, were aware of the tornadoes by uh, sirens, but my son, since he lives so close to Wright Pat, he heard the uh, tornado sirens going off at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, which caused him to look at his phone. Uh, he saw that there was a TVS and that it was just to the east of Interstate 75. He got out of the apartment down to the lowest floor uh, where somebody let him in to the uh, first floor apartment. He was living on the third floor apartment. And uh, again, that uh, just that shocking realization. I mean, I had a tear in my eye after that, I guess maybe a little uh, post-traumatic stress after all this was done. Uh, I didn't even realize he was in the path of the storm. So I guess it all uh, hits us in some way, but uh, it's like, this is what we do. Uh, probably in your career, you're going to have one event like this. And uh, I, guess, I guess that was ours. So again, thank you for all your great efforts. Thanks for the warnings that night. You guys did a tremendous job of covering it all. And uh, I'm sure there are going to be even better uh, technology, better technology to cover these storms in the future. Thanks. Thanks so much, Brian. Uh, and, and McCall and all the rest of the, the people who were covering this on the media tonight and, and getting getting the word out to people. And uh, just so much so much good work was done by, by all of you. And it's so much appreciated. I want to talk a little bit about the community. I've heard stories, you know, I've heard stories of great progress that's been made in some locations in terms of rebuilding and restoration. I've also heard some very honest stories about areas where this process has been slow. Um, a reminder that even after two years, the process of recovering from a natural disaster of this sort is not just a straight line. There, and there's still so much work to be done in some places. But I've seen evidence of the resilience of the community and the ways that people find to help and do good things. Um, I've got this, this image up from Mercer County EMA. Just look at the list of locations that sent help. Electric crews from 13 places, one from Michigan, contractors, fire departments, squads, all coming in to help out from the Salina tornado. Other volunteers on the ground doing not just damage assessment, but making contact with people in heavily affected areas. Um, Shauna with the Red Cross said, uh, Given the wide scale power outages, I chose to send volunteers for boots on the ground reunification. I received a hand letter from a family in Illinois that read, we want to commend your volunteer, Diana, for helping to check on our Dayton friends. We had not been able to reach them after the storms. We are impressed and grateful when Diana went to their house and notified us that they were well and safe. What a wonderful service. People helping out to get other people in contact, make sure that everyone is okay. From Marsha, who worked after the event with the Kiwanis, in, was, the, was the Lieutenant Governor of Division 4. The storms were her first priority. In Brookville, they, of course, they uh, co-sponsored co meals in the community, a backpack project for school children. In Old North Dayton, they teamed up with the Dayton Food Bank to serve 135 households. In Trotwood, they purchased clothing, clothing for elementary school students whose families had lost their homes. In Northridge, they organized a donation of tarps purchase shoes for over 100 people. If you think about the impacts on structures and homes, but as many of the earlier pictures show, there's a huge loss of trees as well. Uh, there's a nonprofit called Retreat, Retreat that is working with the Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission to try to plant a thousand trees in the impacted areas over the next two years. If you've driven through that area or have been through areas impacted by other large tornadoes, you know that even years later, the tree and vegetation loss is one of the most striking things to see. So, so the, through this project, Residents can put in a request for native trees to be planted at their locations. In a community like Trotwood, you have projects like the Tornado Survivors Pathway to Ownership Project. Breaking ground on new homes specifically for families who are impacted by the tornadoes and who are not currently homeowners. This is something that's more than just recovery. It's a chance to help get people into better situations than, than the ones that they started with. That's what we're really going for, isn't it? You take something bad, you make it into something better. There's still challenges, but there are so many signs of good people doing good things for a good community. Here's one more example from Brookville, where the high school was impacted by the early stages of the big EF4 tornado. Um, and a mural from that high school with a, a photo courtesy of one of my friends and hockey teammates who 
works in athletics in the Miami Valley area. The building stands as a testament to the spirit and resilience of the Brookville community. After an EF4 tornado devastated Brookville and this school on May 27, 2019, neighbors, friends, and strangers came together as one to rebuild. As a result, just 80 days later on August 15, 2019, our doors opened for a new school year. These are the things I've seen. I've drove past repaired houses in Salina. I've read of new home construction in West Milton on the same plots of land where I, where I surveyed some of that EF3 damage. I, I watched broadcast meteorologists like the ones that we've heard when become communicators and storytellers for their communities. I've seen service organizations do what they do best. And for us at the National Weather Service, well, we got to get right back to work because that's what we do. That's what we're there for. Um, this is just one tornado outbreak. There will be more tornadoes. Even in the face of a historic tornado outbreak like this, the reminders, the reminders are always there of the people that we serve and the reason that we do it. So we're, we're definitely running longer on time than we had planned on it. But I want to see if there are a couple of, a couple of questions that, uh, that Kristen and Nate have received that would be good to address for the whole group. Yeah, Andy, can you hear me? Yep. So yeah, I mean, we we got flooded with 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 comments, with with questions, with with great stories. Uh, we we really appreciate uh, everybody taking the time to share with us uh, the their questions and and stories. Um, we do have a couple things that we wanted to highlight. Uh, you know, it was kind of interesting that here you are talking about a tornado outbreak within a year that has yet to see a confirmed tornado or a tornado warning. And we did have someone ask at the very beginning, what's causing the quiet season? And, you know, if you were going to go through that tonight, obviously you were, we were all focused on the events of, of this particular day. But I did want to quickly say that, you know, this was a very good question by Ethan. And, uh, and really the reality is the, 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 the weather systems that we've been having move through have just simply not been favorable. Most of that being the fact that we just aren't getting uh, a very good surface moisture source. We're not getting a whole lot of humidity. It's been cooler than normal. We just simply aren't getting the storms, you know, the, in, within an environment that are capable of producing tornadoes. And just a few statistics that, that Andy actually put together for the office. This is the fourth latest uh, time of year that we've never had issued a tornado warning. And this is the eighth latest time that we have yet to confirm a tornado uh, had actually touched down. So this this season has been getting close to historically quiet. And, you know, it's just interesting that we had this question on a night that, you know, here we are talking about a tornado outbreak. Um, for those who are interested in this uh, further, June 12th, 2013 currently holds the record for latest tornado a tornado warning and latest confirmed tornado. So hopefully we keep that streak going and uh, we can avoid any sort of outbreaks like the one that we noted uh, tonight in this presentation. Another interesting request question that we received um, was about lightning strikes. You know, we, we highlighted tornadoes and, and Andy, you even covered a little bit on the hail that occur with these storms, but these thunderstorms were organized and very powerful for, for a very lengthy period of time and produced a ton of lightning strikes. I don't have statistics you know, here on hand to discuss, but I, I did want to reference this, this question by Katrina, which basically asked what the relationship of lightning strikes were to these storms as they moved through the region. And, and really what I wanted to answer to that was, you know, the, the strong you know, shear that we received um, that night really helped facilitate these long lived updrafts. And, and when that's the case, your your storm survived for a very long period of time and they continuing they continue to have strong upward mo upward motion which typically favors very good lightning production as grapple and, and and hail and snow and all this stuff mixes together in the top of our atmosphere so i felt like noting that these storms were organized for so long that it just allowed numerous periods of of intense lightning strikes uh, that were very frequent uh, in time. So just wanted to kind of highlight those um, as uh, as we wrap up tonight. Okay, thanks for sharing those. Um, like Nate said, this has been a very quiet year so far. Um, the history of this office goes back to 1994. So those records, that's what we're talking about. And uh, for our 52 counties that we cover in Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, no tornadoes, none at all. 
nothing even close. This will change. It will absolutely change. And when it does, stay safe, stay weather aware. We'll see you at other Let's Talk presentations sometime in the future. Thank you so much for your attention tonight. Have a great evening, everybody. The following portion of this video will contain stories that were sent to us by people who were personally impacted by the 2019 Memorial Day tornado outbreak. These stories are true accounts shared with us by people who went through the event and in some cases are still dealing with the effects of the tornadoes over two years later. These accounts are narrated by our staff and were lightly edited for time and clarity. This story is from Barbara of Beaver Creek Township, Ohio. I remember the TV person showing a storm in Richmond, Indiana that would track to the west and would be in the Fairborn area in 45 minutes. That was my signal that it was time to prepare. I took all my personal belongings and extra clothes, boots, and rain gear to the basement, got pillows and blankets ready. I woke up my daughter and we moved to the basement and watched TV from there. Between the warnings going off on all cell phones and the urgent messages from Twitter, Facebook, and TV, we went to our safe room. Power went out, and then all we could hear were the winds and trees hitting the house. This lasted for what seemed like five minutes. A friend in Cincinnati texted to say, stay in the basement. I looked outside, and there were 40 to 80 foot trees laying in all directions across the yard, driveway, and against the house. We called and checked in on family. Parents were okay, but had not gone outside to assess the damage. Once they were outside, we could hear the scream from my mother-in-law that the roof was missing. We lost many trees in the five acres of wood surrounding the house. We had minimal structural damage to our home. The family farm just west of us lost the roof to their farmhouse. Another family member lived west of the farmhouse and had minimal structural damage also. This was the second tornado in 14 months to hit the family farm. The farm was hit on April 3, 2018 on the anniversary of the F5 Xenia tornado in 1974. The April 2018 tornado destroyed the silo, barn roof, and garage roof. Repairs from the 2018 tornado were finished on May 27, 2019, just five hours before the Memorial Day tornado destroyed the farmhouse. The barn and the farmhouse were dated back to the 1850s. The farmhouse has been rebuilt and all was completed in late summer of 2020. This story is from Kelly in Northridge, Ohio. On the night of the tornado, my mother and I were in our car watching the storm. We got on I-75 South at Wagner Ford Road just minutes before the tornado hit and we headed toward my grandmother's home in East Dayton. While racing toward our destination, I received the tornado emergency notification on my phone. I looked back toward home, and as a flash of lightning illuminated the sky, I saw the funnel of the tornado, which had otherwise been enveloped in darkness. My dad, however, was back at home with our cat, and by that point, we had no idea if either of them had survived. We arrived at my grandmother's home and began the process of moving toward the interior hallway. I was terrified for my family, scared for my friends, many of whom lived in the Dayton metro area. We called my dad and he picked up the phone, acknowledging that he was okay and the house had been damaged. The next day we went to the house and when I saw the devastation of the neighborhood I'd called home since the early 1990s, I could not contain my tears. That day we tried to pick up small things around the house, but with the tree in the roof, shattered windows and debris everywhere, it was difficult to bear physically and emotionally. The outpouring of our community was great. Some men came to our home to help get rid of the fallen trees, of which we had many. The local fire department provided lunches and essential items. People we never met gave us gift cards for food and supplies. Admittedly, our home is still damaged, while many homes around us are rebuilt. Many agencies cannot help us because we are not homeowners. In the weeks that followed, I began to have flashbacks whenever the weather was unfavorable. I learned I have PTSD. It is only in the past few months that I have personally made strides at recovering the parts of me that haven't been completely whole since that night. The following is an account from Terry in Harrison Township. I knew the storms were coming in after dark, and that is my worst nightmare, a tornado where I can't see it. I had been in a tornado before, 1974 in Cincinnati. I was in the tail end of the Sailor Park tornado in Dent, one of my friends lost her father. 
We had golf ball sized hail just before. The electricity went out. My dad went out to take pictures of the hail and came running back into the house yelling, Get in the basement, now! My dad stayed outside taking pictures, though most did not turn out. So I have been through this rodeo before. Around 8 p.m. on Memorial Day, I was watching a cell in Indiana as it moved east. We got to our home in Harrison Township, near where Hera Arena used to be. We unloaded the car in Drizzle. Once inside, I turned on the lights and the TV, made sure all three cats were where I could find them, and checked the weather. I was watching that cell, and it was literally heading for my house. All TV stations were wall to wall. The sirens went off. My roommate found his handheld amateur radio, and someone was reporting a tornado on Westbrook in Brookville, so our, I called our friend and told her to take shelter. About this time, the tornado warning came out on the phones. I focused on the radar and said, that's a debris ball. I bolted for the interior bathroom. My roommate followed and pulled a mattress into the doorway after us. We could hear things hitting the house. My ears popped. One cat ran under my bed, but my roommate's two cats were in the bathroom with us. The lights went out. I watched the radar on my phone, and when it was past us, we came out. When we went outside much later, all we could see was tree damage. In the morning, we saw how lucky we were. We had lost shingles, tree branches, and siding. One house to the north lost half its roof. The further north you went, the worse the damage. We have friends who live in Shiloh Gardens and another friend that was trapped in his condo right where the EF4 damage occurred by the Stillwater River. My roommate's brother lived in Laura and his house was completely destroyed. The roof taken off and the rain did the rest. Everyone in our neighborhood went checking on everyone else. Are you okay? Do you need anything? We hugged and we cried. Several church groups were calling the area where it was possible to get through, and they offered whatever help you needed. Tarps, chainsaw work, food, hugs and prayers, a sympathetic ear. Whatever you needed. Overall, the rebuilding is good to see. The apartments on Riverside Drive were repaired quickly, but a lot of individuals both in the Shiloh area and around North Dixie Drive were uninsured, so recovery is taking much, much longer. This story is from my father, Tim McGinnis, of Tarleton, Ohio. The tornado hit the north side of our home in southeast Pickway County near Laurelville. My family was in the cellar, but I remained on the main floor with one of our dogs. I tucked myself around the corner by the cellar as the storm hit. I received some cuts from flying glass, but otherwise I was okay. As for our house and barn, they were a total loss. We returned the following morning and began the cleanup. ABC6 and the Columbus Dispatch came out to do a story. Later that week, nearly 75 people from our church, other churches, and the community came together to assist with the cleanup. It was quite a large effort, of which we are very appreciative. Nine months later, we moved into our new home. When thinking back to the events that unfolded that night, the most important lesson I learned was always consider a what-if scenario when it comes to severe weather. Having lived in the classic Tornado Valley for nearly 10 years, we were more used to severe storms and always had things in place in case a storm hit. But in Ohio, especially our area, rarely do we see this kind of storm. When it comes to preparation, practice your safety plan and don't forget to include your pets. We learned that the hard way. Also, as much as I like watching storms, it is important not to get lulled into thinking it won't hit you. I barely made it inside before hearing the winds hit the trees. As soon as it hit, it was over. We were very fortunate to avoid major injury and are thankful to our son and the National Weather Service for providing ample warning. This account comes from Allison in Beaver Creek, Ohio. As the night unfolded, I was messaging a friend in Vandalia to take cover. Then as the action shifted toward Beaver Creek, where I live, we realized it was time to get ready. We got the pets and kids in the basement as we lost power, and the last thing I heard from our local TV coverage was that it looked like it was crossing I-675 near the mall at Fairfield Commons. It was a helpless feeling, having no Wi-Fi, no TV, and poor cell coverage. I watched from our basement window to our northwest, 
through lightning flashes until it became oppressively dark and my gut said to go. I took shelter in our basement with my family under a quilt and I told them I loved them. I felt the pressure change. It was hard to know how long until we were safe. We were about a mile away from the path and had some minor roof damage. Our attic access panel was also dislodged in the garage and our siding was spackled in muddy leaf debris. I love severe weather, but I never want to be that close to something of that scale again. So many volunteers staged to go out and clean up, drop off donated water and food, and provide monetary support. Local Facebook groups popped up to share information. As days went on, the Beaver Creek support spread into our surrounding communities. The following story is from Aaron in Brookville. I had the Brookville tornado start near the end of my road. I could hear the roar going over my house. The lights began to flicker and then went out. I knew it was serious when we lost cell reception. The mood in the basement was extremely tense while we listened to the radio during the outbreak. I remember the fear that overcame me when I heard that the tornado emergency was issued. I remember the fear that dozens of people could be dead. The next day, I went into Brookville to help friends. I had only been graduated from Brookville High School for two days before the event. Seeing the damage to the high school and surrounding areas broke my heart. I was helping former classmates pick up the pieces of their lives. I also saw rival football teams in the neighborhoods picking up Brookville. There were license plates from all around the nation helping. Everyone wanted to help everyone. It was extremely touching. In Brookville, almost everything has been rebuilt. I'm extremely proud of the progress we have made as a community. Thank you to Barbara, Kelly, Terry, Tim, Allison, Aaron, and everyone else who shared their stories with us. And thank you to everyone who watched this presentation. We hope you were able to learn a lot about the historic tornado outbreak on Memorial Day of 2019. For Kristen and Nate, this is Andy, signing out from the National Weather Service in Wilmington, Ohio.